Chabad of Cambodia. No Jew will be left behind. Lots of people come to Cambodia as part of an organized trip. Our goal is to give the Jew a home away from home. You can't build so high near the royal palace. You see 32 meter high. You know the book of the uh, history of Palestine? That's a beautiful book. This actually was our first Torah. The idea is that a box like this sitting on your desk reminds you of the need to give. And in Judaism, giving is not only about how much you give, but the action of giving. Anything you can think of is all in this building. This is the preschool, the online school. It's part of our outreach. We hire the helicopter. The most satisfying is the heart-to-heart -heart talks. If anything happened to anyone on any matter, we are here for that. Place yourself in a place of need. And when you're in the place of need, the need will come. And when you will take actions in time of need, you will become a superhero. It's as simple as that. Morning folks, welcome back to the capital of Cambodia. We are in Phnom Penh and today we are going to be learning and meeting the Jewish community of Cambodia. We're somewhere outside of Chabad, Cambodia by a sketchy back alley here. I'm trying to find exactly where the synagogue is. I don't know where it is, but uh, hopefully in just a little bit we're going to be able to introduce you guys to the amazing Jews that run the community here in Cambodia. All right folks, here we are, Chabad of Cambodia. Should be early morning prayer just started, Shacharit. So we're walking in in the middle of prayer. We're probably going to do this a little bit silently. Yeah, well, they have, uh, they have a bunch of people. I think that's an audio playing. I don't think that's a lot yeah, of people. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Anyways, we're going to go in and pray with the rabbi. Yeah, he has a little supermarket and a restaurant. All right, so we just finished the morning prayer. So we are sitting down to eat here in the restaurant in Chabad, Cambodia. Look at their um, slogan, no Jew will be left behind. I really love that. They've got a little menu here with a bunch of kosher food. All this obviously is going to be for kosher. Roll burger, wow, these prices are amazing as well. So you've got an Israeli Israeli salad breakfast. You've got a tuna sandwich, tuna deluxe, egg sandwich, schnitzel sandwich, tuna burger sandwich, big, big menu. I think to really get a whole idea of the food, I might have to come back here again for lunch today just to show you guys, but maybe we'll start off with a breakfast and show you guys what it's like. And, Prices are phenomenal. I mean, this is really good. Everything's in USD as well. And one of the, my favorite things about exploring these Jewish communities in Southeast Asia has been the prices because kosher food in the United States, very expensive, or in Israel is very expensive, even though everything is kosher. Um, but here in Southeast Asia, the prices have just been amazing. To get kosher meat for $3.80 or a burger for $3.60, that's nuts. Whoa, wow, this is amazing. I did not expect it to look like this from up above. Man, this is an amazing building you have here. You see the building, if you go with straight lines from here, okay? You have the green rooftop, then you have the antenna, uh -huh. and then you'll reach an orange roof, and then right after that, a bit to the left, there is like a clean building with an orange top. Yeah. Now, if you can zoom in, you'll see that the windows are like Purim story windows. You see this ice cream cone window style? Wow. Okay, and he's very well hooked up in the government. And I met him when we were looking for building permits for here, and I was told that he can help me out. I sat in his office right there in the building, and he said, Korosh helped the Jewish nation to build the Holy Temple in Jerusalem. I will help to build the temple here. How much do you want to build? I said, as much as they let. So he said, just give me a height, and I'll get license for it permit for it. I said, really? He says, yes. I said, 30 meters. I was sure he's going to say no. Don't forget, this building was not here then. Mm -hmm. This building is also not. This whole place has a, there's a law that you can't build so high because it's near the royal palace. The royal palace is right here. That's the royal palace. Yes. I, I was sure that when he said 30, I said 30 meters, he'll say no. It's too much. But he said, go for it. Just provide me plans and uh, I'll, I'll make that approval. This is 32 meter high. My name is Rabbi Ben Zion Butman, born and raised in the city of Lod. Spent the first 20 years of my life in Israel. I then went to yeshiva in the US, and between US, Toronto, getting married, staying in Crown Heights, it's about uh, seven years in the US and Canada. We got married in 2007 and moved here in 2009. In 2009, you moved to Phnom Penh. Did you live anywhere else in Asia before that? No. Just Not directly only here. we didn't leave, but we didn't even visit before coming here. Mm -hmm. We came here first uh, for Pesach in 2009, which took place actually right there in the Cambodiana Hotel. Okay. And we had no less than 70 Jews for the Seder. 
towards the end of Seder when it was time to eat Afi Koman. I uh, was looking for my Afi Koman and it wasn't anywhere to be found. I said, everyone knows where my Afi Koman and there was a group of people in the back sitting and laughing. We need to continue the Seder. They're like, no, no, we got to get a prize for the Afi Koman. I said, what do you want of me? An iPhone? No. <laughs> they said, no, we want you to promise us that there will be a permanent Chabad center in Kimberley. And I looked at my wife, she says, don't look at me. And she was right because she made up with me before we went, before we came here. We did come to consider it, but she said, you're quick to decide, I'll take longer. Do me a favor until a month after Pesach, I do not want to hear from you. So are we going? It really wasn't fear of me to look at her like this. Anyway, I couldn't come up with a proper answer. I just told them that I'm gonna pass on the request to the headquarters. Three days later, we were sitting at the boarding gate at the airport. The airport was very small at the time, but uh, from the other side of the airport, someone was coming running. He handed me his business card, like the do here with two hands, and uh, he asked me to contact him upon arrival in the US. I said, whoa, looks like an urgent matter. What happened? He said, no, I just want to follow up with you because I was at the Seder and I, you, you committed. So he wasn't part of that group, but he also wanted to know what's going on. I remember I received, you know, he gave me the card in two hand, with two hands. I received it with two hands. I remember he walked, he ran back to his flight. I was holding the card like this. My hands were shaking. I turned to my wife. I said, look, we will go to open a Chabad house in Pitchery City in Atlanta, which is one of the places we were looking at. People will run away. Someone will deny that he's Jewish, even though his last name is Khan. And when, when I finally meet him face to face, and he'll have no choice but to hand me his business card, he'll make sure it's the office business card that doesn't have his mobile phone on. And here, people are running to us and asking us, to please come. It was strongly appealing to us ever since we're here. This building was actually similar to all these homes you can see down, uh -huh. down there. So we were looking for land short four years, a little less than four years after our arrival here. This plot of land particularly appealed to me. Of course, I would prefer being on the main road, but land prices in the alley were half the price and on the main road. And even that was something which I thought was crazy. There's no mortgage here. So I had to put down the money up front. The cost was something I couldn't have imagined putting together, but we decided to go for it anyway. And yeah, retroactively was a smart choice. The reason why we chose this you know, place in particular is because this is directly across the entrance to the Royal Palace. So you have hundreds, if not more, 20, 30, 40 buses a day loaded with, with tourists that come and they unload and offload right here. Mm -hmm. People stand right at that corner, spot beautifully the entire building with the massive logo that we have in that corner. Um, lots of people come to Cambodia as part of an organized trip and the only connection they'll have is in that moment and then I'll get an email or a whatsapp they say ah oh, we saw it and we asked permission and we left but in many cases I'll just get an email saying oh this is so nice we came to Cambodia for five days sorry we couldn't stop by because we we're part of the whole group but we saw your building from afar and it filled us up with joy and that's part of what we're here for to fill people's hearts with joy it's a little hard to uh, maintain and maintain an intensive or religious daily schedule when the environmental motivation isn't there mm -hmm. it's not unique to cambodia it's in any case you open the chabad in a place in which you don't have like for example daily minion and stuff it's a little hard to face the lack of understanding sometimes basic understanding i'm talking about as far as communication when it comes to uh, expectations of the local population, of the staff. But at the same time, there are many benefits. Lots of things are very affordable here. Manpower is affordable. I work very little. There's a lot that is done by other people. I have Chabad friends, Chabad rabbi friends who are in, uh, whether on campus or regular Chabad house, they would be washing dishes for three hours every Friday night. We don't have, I mean, we have that. Dishes are washed, it's just not us. Um, a lot of, we had a, a Lagba Omer party on the roof. It means bringing up things, taking down things. I, for me, it was a regular day. I was able to sit and learn. I was able to reach out to people. I didn't do all of that work. I had staff, it's all done by them. So it, that really allows a single-handed Chabad house to do a lot more than what, it, what I would be able to do in a, in a Western country. What does it mean to be part of Chabad and like why, why are you here in Cambodia specifically? One question answers the other. Uh, first is why Jews are here and the answer is that Jews are everywhere. 
I used to think that uh, Phnom Penh is a big wall to find Jews at. I have found Jews in such remote places that you couldn't even imagine a Westerner will ever spend uh, life at. I was once approached by a religious business person living in California, coming here for business regularly. Then once we spoke and he said, how about that family that used to live in Phnom Penh and moved into a loch, into a hole, into like nowhere within Cambodia. And then he said, wait, wait, not to say that Phnom Penh is a center. Phnom Penh is also a loch. It's also like a, like a nowhere. But Phnom Penh is the center of nowhere. <laughs> they moved to the nowhere within the nowhere. <laughs> but there are Jews all over. There are about, pre-corona, nearly 120 Jews that lived in Phnom Penh. The numbers have been reduced a bit, but a similar number around the country, which makes it about 200 people in this country. We're here, um, like you saw uh, on our motto, no Jew will be left behind. We're here because our goal is to give a Jew a home away from home, no matter how far away from home he is. In fact, uh, Chabad in Cambodia, at least as of its early stages, has served a double purpose. It is both serving the Jews that are actually coming to Chabad and benefiting from it, but it also serves as a statement to all Jews, wherever they are. Place on earth is too remote to have a center open, and no quantity of Jews is too little for Chabad to be open. By now we're bigger than that. We have a, a beautiful large building. We have a minion every Shabbos. Um, I guess that role has passed on to Shluchim who are even more brave than me and have opened play, play centers in, even, in places that are even more remote and less populated. We are reaching the no Jew will be left behind now through outreach to smaller cities like sending khalas to a village in which girl is on Peace Corps and have not uh, experienced any Jewish action for since Rosh Hashanah, for instance, and she's, she calls and says, can I have Hala? And that's how we confirm that no Jew will be left. Do you have like any sort of brief history on the Jews of Cambodia? Were there Jews here pre-Chabad? Yes, you know the book of um, uh, the history of Palestine, Palestine? No, I mean, I've probably heard it in passing, but... It's a beautiful book. Uh -huh. The history of Palestinians in Palestine. It's a beautiful thick book with a nice cover and then you open it and it's empty because that's their history, right? They don't uh -huh. have any history. We don't have any history here. The earliest I know is that in 1991 there was a uh, uh, Seder done by American soldiers which happened to be here on a mission. I believe maybe 30, 40 years earlier there could have been like, uh, you know, unofficial gatherings of Jews that have met here. But as far as I know, there is no proper history here. There, it, when we came, there was not a cemetery, and I think that's, a, that's an indication. There wasn't a cemetery here. Now we have one. We opened one uh, nine years ago, and unfortunately, it's more populated than I thought it would be. We have nine people buried them there by now. This sandwich right here looks like something my mom would make. I'm so excited for this. <laughs> It's simple, there's nothing crazy about it, you know, it's a, it's a tuna sandwich with vegetables inside, but it looks so good. And then we've got a shakshuka breakfast, two eggs, nice shakshuka, some fresh challah bread, and we've got an Israeli salad. Very, very excited to dig into this. We have like a platter of some delicious, amazing kosher food here. How does kosher food actually work in Cambodia? Well, the truth is the things that are on your plate are not challenging at all. Mm -hmm. The salads are made of vegetables which are local, um, the egg is local. The bread is almost entirely local. Uh, the yeast is the only thing that comes from out of country. And the tuna, the tuna is the only thing I import. We get a shipment from Israel once a year with every shelf food possible. Starting of course with matzah, which is most basic and wine. And then anything that can last joins the containers, such as tuna, for instance, or other cans. Uh, snacks that the Israeli backpackers like to see. For uh, chicken, we get from Thailand. Thailand, uh, Thailand has a large factory of uh, kosher chicken. And then I have systematic import of frozen goods from South Africa. So we get uh, beef, we get lamb, we get cold cuts and hot dogs, and even some dairy stuff. Wow. That are done, are coming from South Africa, like uh, cream cheese and cottage cheese and uh, butter. So and you don't actually do any shrita here yourself? No, we never did. We never ever did shkita here ourselves. Uh, people often ask me about this and um, 
I, I, I really can't relate to the idea. I mean, uh, there are yeshivas in Israel that have a thousand students eating three meals a day, and no one thought, oh, we have so much need for chickens, why don't we open our own slaughterhouse? It doesn't work. It's, or a yeshiva, we will study Torah, someone else does that. So same here, as long as I have a safe and secured way to get things from town, I have no reason to do this. Same is about uh, beef. And like generally kosher products, can you find them in supermarkets so, and stuff like that here? You know what, I, I, I would actually take you to Super Duper to, to take a look because I think in that particular front, Cambodia has a greater advantage over our neighboring countries for having a very large variety of kosher products. Generally, many supermarkets have imported stuff. You see, if you talk about Thailand, they produce everything on their own. Uh, Cambodia doesn't. Cambodia imports. And once you import to get things uh, by land from Thailand or get things by boat from US, maybe almost the same cost, which makes a lot of um, famous brands land here, like ketchup, mustard, oil, things that come with kosher certification. From other places in the West? From, from the West, correct. And Amazing. then on top of this, there is a supermarket here that particularly looks for international brands mm -hmm. and they bring a lot of things from the West and they've literally 10% of their supermarket is kosher. They even have Pasi Sral Bagels. Wow. So Pasi Sral Bagels. Well, take you to the supermarket, you'll see it's super you know, duper. It's, it's not too far from here. It's Amazing. And I'm actually curious because we, every time we get to a big city, we make a conscious effort to try to eat at a vegan or vegetarian restaurant experience and I was actually thinking about you when we, we've eaten at like two or three vegan restaurants this week is that something that uh, Jewish people like doing shlichut or living abroad can eat at can you eat at an all veg vegan Myself, restaurant I won't. you won't, I won't because uh, I know oil can also be problematic even if it's a vegetarian uh, vegetable oil uh -huh. with hot stuff I don't know what was used for what so myself I won't I will surely encourage people who are shomer kashrut to take advantage of such option People want natural America's food. People tell me I'm vegetarian. I'm actually happy. I don't strongly believe in strict uh, vegetarian menu, but I do think that for Jews, it does help. When they become vegetarian, they stay away from trouble. I'm not reviewing anything exotic right now, but I'm, I'm excited for this. Either way, it's going to be yummy. Check it out. A little mom's tuna sandwich. First place, first synagogue I've ever seen that does for free. This one's free. You don't pay for it, you just come and you eat. Mm. Wow. Really good food that one. To the shakshuka. Looks amazing as well. Eggs cooked perfectly. Just how we like them. Mm. Really good as well. And I think like as a backpacker, if you're trying to keep kosher or you're coming here and you're traveling, you want to keep kosher, just for the price alone. As we've talked about in many series that we've done now in different kosher places around the world or different um, Jewish communities around the world, the food can be super, super expensive to make it kosher. And here it's just very affordable. There's almost zero excuse if you're keeping kosher, if you want to adhere to the Jewish law to not come here and eat. It's super good, super cheap. Can I ask, maybe people are curious about your morning routine with the tea. I just saw you eat a whole clove of garlic. So my day is somewhat to some parts of it, very, very structured. I set up a uh, learning time, starting from 7 a.m. in the morning. Most of it, I should say, is with others, so it helps me keep it uh, disciplined. As part of this routine is also a health routine, so this is not a pleasure tea. It has a lot of lemon juice, honey, you can spot here the ginger. I'm curious, did you pick this up in Israel? Is this a, a th like something you did? Because this is a very Asian thing. It's an Asian thing. Yeah. And ginger is very Asian, but uh, it's healthy. Yeah. And uh, like you said, like you pointed out, a fluff of, um, of garlic, that's, a, that's more of an Israeli thing to do. I've been living in the Philippines the last couple of years, so every time I would get sick, either, either if it's my viewers or my friends, always recommend tea with lemon and garlic inside, and sometimes even onion. Maybe you can tell the viewers that are watching this, what, I'm sure a lot of people have no idea where we are right now, but like, what is this space? We're in a synagogue, clearly, but also in your office at the same time? I sit at the back of Shul. I did not, I purposely did not designate a uh, space for my personal office because I want to be involved. I don't want to have a four wall, I want to be approachable. And many times I will take my laptop downstairs and sit at the restaurant to work so people, go, people can feel more comfortable coming over and also can be more involved in what's going on. It's kind of like I don't have an office. 
to the desk at the back of shul, I sit here sometimes, especially if someone needs a quiet meeting and downstairs it's populated. So this is, I wouldn't call this my office. It's one of the corners I sit. <laughs> it's one of the corners that you work at. And what about all the books? There's lots of books around me right now. Um, it has been around for thousands of years and it has produced lots of uh, material. Um, I can't say I study all these books, but I definitely opened uh, most of them. Is it necessary for somebody like you, like a rabbi in a synagogue, to have all these books around? All these books? No. I know rabbis who can manage with a quarter, but uh, even less. Mm -hmm. But uh, I like books. What about actually getting them to Cambodia? This was flown in, shipped in over the ocean? or It was shipped in. I mean, the, the truth is the greatest project of sending over the books was when I got married in the U.S. And I had to bring over 50 boxes of books from Israel to the U.S., which was done by my devoted brother through friends and family who were coming to the wedding. Uh, without any uh, moving company. Then, once we moved from US to here, we did make a, sh a shipment, a container shipment, a sea shipment, mm. which included also lots of kosher food, the shelf food and stuff, the amounts of the wine as we discussed before. And there was also the boxes of books. And those things being imported over, like overseas, like through a container shipment, they can't, does it arrive in Cambodia directly or it needs to be brought um, from Thailand? No, no, Cambodia has a port, has more than one port. Mm -hmm. There's actually one port down the road from here. I don't know, though, um, why containers are not coming here. Uh, most container sea shipment will arrive at sea on the full port, and mm -hmm. from there by truck, it's a five-hour road or so. Well, I am curious to get a tour of the synagogue, and I'm sure that a lot of people here also want to know and have questions about what is what and what we're actually looking at. So maybe you can give us a little tour of your home slash religious place. Of this room? Of this room and the, hopefully the whole building. This room in particular is called a synagogue. That's a dedicated room to prayer. That's the place where we come to disconnect from the intensive life and meditate on the connection we may maintain with our Creator. Uh, one thing that will differentiate this room from all the many other places, particularly in this building, the only place that we will see a separation between men and women, mm -hmm. uh, simply because some men not pointing blaming finger to anyone, can't really focus and meditate when they have uh, an imam sitting uh, next to them um, and may, get their, may attract their attention. So at prayer time, we sit men on one side of shul, women on the other side, and actually in olden days, many shuls were set where ladies would sit in the back of shul, uh, which of course made some ladies feel uh, unwelcome and uh, unappreciated. Here, despite the narrow structure of the building, we decided to go side by side, and not only this, but the wall separating, the partition separating between men and women is actually a one-way see-through, where men can't see clearly into the women's section, but if you go to the other side, you will see beautifully into the men's section. A uh, synagogue has an ark, which inside is the Holy Torah, the bima, in which you place the Torah at, and the front will have the Amud, where the cantor will be leading the congregation. So the Torahs that are here are all with interesting stories. I think there's an interesting story here. This actually was our first Torah. Ten short weeks after our arrival here, I visited New York and we came over to a friend, Rabbi Rubashkin. If you know the famous story of, uh, of uh, Rubashkin from the slaughterhouse, that's his brother. And his Torah was... Uh, part of the Rebbe's shul for many years, and mutual friends told me don't even think of asking him, he wants to show the Torah in the Rebbe's shul, he's not going to give it to you. However, I went over to his house on Shabbos afternoon, and with his generosity, that has been part of our shul um, by now almost 14 years. Oh, wow. This is a, a Torah that states on it, he gave it as a present to the Rebbe, and it is now um, borrowed at our Chabad house. A year later, maybe a little less, I received a phone call from Rabbi Kotlarski from Chabad headquarters inquiring if I need a Torah. I said, we don't have one of our own yet, we have one we borrow. He said he has someone that is looking to donate a Torah. Upon the conclusion of a Torah, which took almost a year and making the celebration, the donor, Mr. Buberic, came all the way from Bogota, Colombia, here to be celebrating with us. And at the celebration, he shared that uh, the story is a present that is actually a promise. He told God he was in a relation with a non-Jewish girl, which was upsetting him also. Eventually that was over and he said to God, if I find my Jewish mate, I'll donate a Torah. A very short while later he met his wife. Eventually he decided that it's time to pay off 
he went over to Rabbi Rosenfeld, Chabad in Bogotá, and he said, Rabbi Rosenfeld, I need to give a Torah. Rabbi Rosenfeld says, great. Daughter and son-in-law are in uh, Pennsylvania um, on campus, Chabad on campus. And he looked at Rabbi Rosenfeld and said, I don't know Pennsylvania, I want something more exotic. So Rabbi Rosenfeld sent him to Rabbi Kutlarski, who reached out to several places. I don't remember now all the potential names he mentioned, but there were places more exotic than Cambodia on that list. Mm -hmm. However, he happened to have had his honeymoon with his wife in Simrik, and he figured if the honeymoon was in Cambodia, perhaps this Torah belongs to Cambodia. Oh, and that's wow. How this Torah. <laughs> Amazing. And this uh, Torah, the most new Torah, is actually a very tragic one. This is uh, written by my wife's family um, in memory of my brother in law who was murdered. Uh, in Chicago. It was just shot in Chicago um, on Simchat Torah a few years ago and that's a Torah that his family, he, he was single, was not yet married and that's that's his continuation, that's his legacy. Is our, our motto, we said no Jew will be left behind it actually comes from the words of the Prophet saying that when it comes time for Mashiach to arrive God will be holding hand to each and every single Jew no matter where he is and bring him along to the Holy Land. Can you explain that concept, maybe for people who don't understand it, like Mashiach, and how big of a part it plays in Chabad? The Rambam, Maimonides, points at Mashiach as one of the 13 principles of faith. Mm -hmm. Although, another principle of faith is that everything said in Torah is true, which makes it no understanding why is Mashiach needs to be a separate principle. What's wrong with someone? who is not aware of Mashiach. What's wrong with someone who thinks Mashiach is a myth that is meant to help us overcome hard moments or hard parts of history? In the Tanya, in the basic book of philosophy of, of, of Chabad, the Chabad uh, movement, the Alter Rebbe explains that Mashiach is not only a prize which we will get eventually if we behave properly, it is the result of everything that happens here. God purposely wanted to hide himself in the creation is because he wants us to have a free choice. If truth would shine, we wouldn't have a, an, the ability to choose the wrong way. Because God isn't shining from everywhere, that's why we sometimes do good and sometimes we fail. The goal is that the good that we do in this world will ultimately lead to the point in which God will finally switch on the light and we will all see how everything is God, how all this production is dependent on Him. And that is Mashiach, not just a price, not just a fantasy. It's actually the ultimate purpose of this world. Everything we do as Jews is part of this. That's why the Rambam says, you gotta know what you work for. Books have always been part of me. I collected books since I may be six. This is a special print, and this is leather cover. Some of them are uh, actual leather. Some of them are fake leather, like this one. You can see the difference. These covers were actually produced in Cambodia. The contractor worked somewhere in the city, and being Jewish, he contacted, contacted me. And then eventually, when things fell apart, he suggested that I take the leftovers, which is what I have wow. here. Wow. This was made before building was completed. This was actually given as a souvenir at the inauguration. Uh -huh. So it's a little miniature model of the Chabad building. Um, this is called a charity box, a tzedakah box. And the idea of a tzedakah box is not to accumulate more money for Chabad. In fact, when I gave it to people, I told them, this is not meant to have money for Chabad in particular. If you want to give it a different purpose, it's also fine. The idea is that a box like this sitting on your desk reminds you of the need to give. And in Judaism, giving is not only about how much you give, but the action of giving. You see, talking about Mashiach, talking about making the world a better place, every action of giving is a step. So look, talking about routine. Here in my drawer, I keep for myself a bunch of coins, which are mine. And then every morning before prayer, I'll drop some coins. In the box. If I have an important meeting, I'll open it, I'll drop some coin before the meeting. For every occasion, my wife keeps a box like this at the kitchen every time before she starts cooking. She has a bowl with coins right next to it. You see the box, you're reminded of your obligation, you drop off of, you drop in a few coins, you did another mitzvah. So by taking this beautiful model and turning it into a charity box, we brought into people's homes a 
mean through which they can do a mitzvah. Our Torah, the Gubar Torah from Bogota, we gave out a souvenir to each and every participant, a model of a Torah. And inside this, we have, we have copies. It's a copy of what a Torah looks like, mm. which means that every person that walked home with this actually brought the five books of Moses into his house and made his home a home not only for people, but also for the Holy Scripture. Now you open this up. This is a copy of the way the Torah looks from inside. And this is actually the entire five books. That is super cool. This is like, <laughs> I don't know, I don't explain this. this is like a, like the collection of all the exclusive Chabad uh, props that you can get from Cambodia. <laughs> this is like limited edition. It's so cool. This is limited edition. And wow. yes, it also gives us the ability to treat donors with uh, souvenirs, right. which is of course helpful to maintain our the service. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Service with lots of friendly songs that people appreciate the minimum from home. How many then, people on average come to the Kiddush? Or um, the average depends. It, it uh, varies from uh, 30 people to 100 people. Depends on wow. Season. I also just wanted to stop by and look at this window. What a cool view from this window. Here is our social hall. And social hall is as big as shul, but we keep it with different sizes. Mm -hmm. So we see this is about uh, 60, 56 people that can sit here. We have 54 people that can sit here without uh, extension. But then in case we have more people, we can always open the curtain and have a continuation of this uh, room. Uh, since Corona, we actually never opened it. I mean, we opened it for big events, but not on Friday night. Uh, Friday night has been smaller. It has reached 60 people, but that's enough. Um, I prefer, if possible, to keep the staff working there instead of the small service room. Mm -hmm. So we hope for traffic to pick again and uh, for the need of this uh, room to be too small for us because that's what I said when we moved into the building that our job now is not only to utilize the building but to make sure it's too small <laughs> let's keep it growing the third floor is my house my family residence and also a balcony which uses as a sukkah on the holiday of support we need to sit under the stars this is the entrance to my house mm -hmm. Living, working, and existing all in the same building, does it ever get stressful? Is it difficult or you wouldn't want to work? It's the most pleasurable thing I can think of. It's extremely convenient. I can be in both places at the same time. Mm -hmm. My wife with the kids know that within 30 seconds I can show up if need be. Yet, it can collect trouble. In other words, I can find myself sometimes walking out of the building with the same thing. Last time I walked out was about uh, 10 days ago, which is crazy. And I try not to, try to make appointments outside for Saturday, because you do need some time of, uh, in between the things. Is it a rule? Do you have to live in the same building as no, the same time? No, not at all. No. In fact, this building is a home for everything we need, aside for one thing. I'll let you guess what that is. but. The ladies' mikvah, the men's mikvah, the, the industrial kitchen, the social hall, the preschool for the kids, the guest units, my offices, storages, beautiful rooftop, library, anything you can think of is all in this building. What can't be in this building? And I'm happy you're not coming up with it so fast. It, it means these things are not in your mind. Uh, I don't know. Cemetery. Ah. May you live for long and not need this, but that's the only thing we can't do within the building, and we do. Mm -hmm. We have a cemetery, we opened a cemetery nine years ago. It's in a different place. It's uh, about 35 kilometers from here. Oh, wow, it's far out. Yes, yeah, it can't be within the city, especially for the locals who are very much believing in uh, all kinds of spirits. And oh, having right. a cemetery next door means reducing the price of their land, so we had to go far out. Right, right, because in Cambodia, from Buddhism, which most people practice, they burn the bodies, most right? Most people burn, but we found an area in which there are other communities that would bury, and that's why that's where we bought our flat. It's not allowed to be in the city because of the Cambodian I'm law. not allowed. It's just nothing that they will appreciate. Gotcha. So, okay. There's no real zoning in this place. Mm -hmm. This floor is guest units. This room we call the, the Shabbos room. This is a room in which we offer local Jews to come try a Shabbos. You know, Shabbos may be very hard in 2023. For someone to disconnect from the phone for 23, 25 hours, it seems like impossible. 
And we say, come here, I sit with people in advance, make sure they have um, ready material and all the stuff. Usually people walk off a such Shabbos with a big woe, with a cleared mind, with a peace of mind. And uh, having this room within the same building helps us encourage people to do it, people challenge each other to do it, which is very nice. Every room like this is occupied with a toilet and a beautiful shower. And we have four rooms like this in this floor. Amazing. And you've got an absolutely beautiful view from uh, from this room. You can see this, this large roof is actually the Supreme Court mm -hmm. and then the Royal Palace and the Mekong River, of course. Gorgeous view. Absolutely amazing. And so this is done bit by bit. There were originally floor number five. And this is my wife's favorite floor. This is the preschool and online school. Wow. This is a floor she actually designed. Oh my God. This is amazing. This uh, corner is what's known as the, as the online school. My children join the online school with other Chabad children's children. And they sit here from the age of six till the age of 14 and study with uh, classmates from uh, Korea, from Thailand, of course, from China, from Vietnam, from India. And all the ones join the European division and get uh, Chabad Shluchim from all over Europe as well. This means that they start their school at 1 or 2 p.m. and finish at 7 8 p.m. This is amazing. The morning preschool. Uh, children enjoy this environment, as you can see. Lots of thoughts were put by my wife with the design of this room. You can see the beautiful clouds on top. Yeah, that's so cool. And the uh, color-oriented theme of this room with the six permanent colors that can reflect on the floor and the furniture, and the ceiling. Mm -hmm. uh, children love it. This is amazing. I've never, I've never seen this in the Chabad yet. Physically, we have the Sunday school. The mm -hmm. Hebrew school, which depends from what year to the next. The largest year we had was 2018. We had 17 or 18 students wow. here every Sunday. Different ages, but we worked it out. Uh, children really loved it. We still receive uh, regards until today with ch children singing the songs they learned here about Shabbat and other things. It's really, it's really a nice program. That program is set up for, for Jewish kids? from religious Non-religious, like families who happen to be traveling in Cambodia. Uh, not traveling, they happen to be living in Cambodia. Living. They're part of a, uh, an embassy, or they're part of uh. an NGO. They live here for a year, for two years, for three years. Now, floor number six, we're going to see something which is uh, somewhat unique for uh, our Chabad, at least within the close region, and that is the dorms. We opened a uh, dormitory, separate uh, sleeping arrangements, of course, for boys and girls. We have two rooms, one for boys and one for girls. And this gives the travelers a home away from home in the most literal meaning of it. Lots of folks were going to this, for example. There's no control of the electricity available for the public because we want the shadows to be kept here. So everything is hidden. Every unit is occupied with a locker. Wow. Fingers. <laughs> this is amazing. <laughs> uh, these floors actually in 2015 when we moved into this building had nothing. No no tiles, uh -huh. no doors, and of course no furniture and air conditioners. Later on, three or four years later, we got the courage and funds to continue. We moved. This is uh, functioning for about a year right now. This is next level. This is so dope. Wow, this is, it's a Jewish hostel. It's so cool. <laughs> That's what it is. It gives the wow. traveler, provide them not only with food or listening ear, also with a bed. And I can, I can attest that heart-to-heart uh, -heart talks with travelers, which I've done many, and it's, I would say, most my most favorite. But I've saved lives in the literal sense of it, like, with a helicopter evacuation or accidents and all kinds of things. I also dealt with an end of life cases, but the most satisfying is the heart to heart talks of particularly young, not only, but particularly young travelers who are going through all sorts of emotions. So sometimes it's post army and they open up after an intensive trip and get really get healed. No, not to say that I'm a healer, but sometimes it's, just about listening. Sometimes it's a good word. And ever since we opened here, 
people feel more comfortable and there's many more cases of people that take advantage of our hearts and not only our beds. Wow, I you know I've been travel I've been on the road for nine years now. I can attest it doesn't happen so often anymore that I end up sleeping in a Chabad house. Even though in the early days of my travels, I used to a lot. I don't do it so much now. But to have access to a place like this, if you end up in Phnom Penh, if you're here for business, if you're here on a on a backpacking trip, to have access to come to be with like-minded Israeli or Jewish backpackers in a place where you have a restaurant and a place to pray and a safety net and a support system like you. That is so amazing. Seriously, this is, I'm, I'm really blown away by this. I have never seen this in a Chabad house yet. There's two separate rooms, as I said. This is the boys' room. Mm -hmm. Then you're gonna get a toilet for the boys, a shower. Um, and oh, then nice. there's the, the, the girls' dorm, which has, which has an, extra, an extra door. Mm -hmm. So this is a no entry for men. Now we can enter because so there's no one here. Uh, and then they have a similar or identical room for with the eight units of for eight travelers. Mm -hmm. And then there's toilets and a shower, and of course the their uh, toothbrushing corner is more secure than the young boys. And then the rooftop. And that's the last last floor is the rooftop. Yeah. Cool. It's part of our, our outreach. We hired a helicopter. I flew from here after Shachwit and Prime with a stop in Kampot and a stop in Koran and Siem Rip uh, and back here in time for the party and we managed to get the hundreds of, the hundreds of Jews that otherwise we wouldn't have reached them. I went with a helicopter ah. to Medilla and stopped by heavily populated cities arranged in advance people were waiting for the helicopter wow. to land and then we landed and <laughs> Medilla meeting and dancing and L'chaim and Mishlach Manot and stuff whatever needs to be done on the holiday oh and God. continued to the next destination Wow, that is one of the coolest things. You did. You basically did like a Jewish, like on-demand helicopter service. Like you dropped it in a helicopter. Was like, all right, here's your Jewish service. On to the next one. Okay. <laughs> that okay. is amazing. That is one of the coolest That's things. The motto, no Jew will be left behind. <laughs> if it takes a helicopter, we'll move the helicopter. Listen, that is the most Chabad story I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> we are the only entity, any sort of entity of uh, Jewish presence in the two hundred and twenty thousand square kilometers of this country. You have tens of thousands of Jews here every year, and if anything happened to anyone on any matter, we are here for that. You know, mm -hmm. when you're a Chabad in Miami and someone comes to you and says, ah, oh, I need my son, bar, bar mitzvah preparation. So you say, okay, a hall you take from this hall, a kosher catering you take from this catering, music you take from this guy, I'm in charge of the Torah lessons, even if it's full and you send them elsewhere to purchase. Here, someone comes to me and said, I want to get married, as it was, we were the rabbi, we were the classes, pre, we were the hall, we were the caterer, we were the music, we were even the flowers we ordered. It's, you can't, there's no one else to delegate responsibilities to. And this also means that if someone is, has a child in the hospital here, he's trying to communicate from overseas with the hospital and they can't, they call us. I do these things on a regular basis. Lost passport, lost travelers, mental um, issues. We had once a case of a lady, she did not take her pills for two days and then took a flight to see him rip, and that's it. They gave me a copy of her passport without, without any leads. Four hours later, this, to remind this is a city five hour, six hour drive from here. Four hours later, I found her. Because I took that passport copy and I uh, reached out to people to all the guest houses and hotels in Siem Rip with a copy of the passport to inquire if that lady is there. It took four hours and they found her. Uh, a few days later she arrived back at home safe. I've flown with uh, uh, people who have unfortunately took a little too much of things that they shouldn't take any of. I've flown home with because they couldn't fly alone. Back to their country, whether it was Israel, I did, and, um, I've had a few cases. I found myself on a plane with a short notice of about six hours. I flew to Israel, I was on ground for 24 hours, and I had to come back. Purim was that week. That's crazy. I, was had, I once had a case uh, looking for a uh, boy in trouble, in which I reached out to the, I shouldn't say the name, but an ambassador, an embassy that is here. And then I spoke to the consul, and I met with the consulate, and he says to me, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to find him. He says, and then you'll find him. What will you do? I said, I'll bring him home. So you can't bring, you have children, you can't bring him to your house. 
I said, I hear you. He said, no, no, Rabbi, really, you should not bring such person into a house with kids. I said, consulate, if this was your child, would you also say you shouldn't be coming to any home? He said, yeah, I understand you, but it's not your child. I said, well, it is. I went to the woods to look for him knowing nothing. It was a rainy day. All I knew is that an hour earlier he was at the embassy. And lo and behold, I, I took my car to roam around those, those streets and I found a foreign child, fine, fine, a foreign boy walking around in the rain. I stopped my car. I said his name. Let's say it was Dave, it wasn't Dave. He says, well, how do you know my name? Anyway, I took him home and gave him attention and sat with him. And uh, a few days later, his father came and picked him up to go home. I can attest personally, I don't, I don't think this is a story I've ever shared, but like I, I was in a category five super typhoon around a year and a half ago in the Philippines. And the first people that my mother was able to get in touch with when all our internet was gone, we were off the grid completely. Nobody knew if we were alive or not. We had, we had witnessed a horrific, atta- or a horrific uh, natural disaster. It was uh, the Chabad in Manila. They were the ones on the ground trying to make connections, trying to put us in touch. The rabbi from there, Rabbi Yossi, was the one who was in touch with my mother who was freaking out for over a week without any contact to me, reassuring that everything was going to be okay and trying to get in touch. So the reason why maybe sometimes you guys are wondering why we're doing so many videos in Chabad's and synagogues across Asia is for me, telling the story of people like you who are doing this service, in my opinion, that is, I, I look at it and sometimes wish I could do the same. I don't know if my nature would ever allow me to, but it is so inspiring to see you guys do this stuff, the way that you guys do it and the way that the message and the mission is so ingrained in your brain, the purpose, it's truly inspiring. Like you guys are modern day superheroes in every sense of the word. No, no, I'll give you the recipe. It's very simple. <laughs> okay. All you have to do is place yourself in a place, in a place of need. And when you're in the place of need, the need will come. And when you will take actions in time of need, you will become a superhero. It's as simple as that. So super duper. Alcoholic beverages. Mm-hmm. Everything is kosher. O-U-D, which means non visceral dairy. Mm-hmm. But if you do, you can definitely find Hershey's here. Oh no, here it is, U-D. This and Pas Israel, maybe you could explain one more time what that means, Pas Israel. It's baked with Jewish inter- intervention. And look, even this triple chocolate fudge cake, kosher. Means also O-U-D, right there. Fruits and vegetables can only be problematic if they are from Israel. So fruits and vegetables here, which are mostly not from Israel, the only fruits that come from Israel that I know of in the local markets are dates. These are all the kosher signs. Mm-hmm. These are Australian products. Yeah, but in order to have kosher, they should have here, the CRC. CRC? Yeah, that's a kosher sign. Uh-huh. Some of these will also have the kosher sign. One, two, three, this is O-U-D. Milk. We've actually a Jewish owned farm. So in the American products you will see over here O K D O U D. Now of course uh, these are also kosher. We buy them at the time. This is kosher, hummus, and guacamole used to also be here, also kosher right there. Strawberry jam. Nutella generally will be kosher, no? Oh interesting. I don't think it is. No, look at that. Wow. I thought Nutella was always kosher. Oh you, oh you, oh you, oh you, oh you, okay? All fine. We are rolling in the oh you. <laughs> Culture products are produced in Asia heavily. Oh, really? Uh, I don't know if that's going to happen. Uh, the reason why there's so many cultures in Asia is because of the Western consumption, not because mm. of the local consumption. Much of the food from in the West actually comes from here. Oh, really? There's no kosher pork? I could have sworn this bacon was kosher. Sauces. Oh yeah. Not all, but here, this is kosher. Yeah, they got kosher. kosher. Alright, looks like we got a really good gauge of the kosher uh, products. A... You've got bagel, cream cheese, and kosher salmon. I don't really know what else you need, you know? That's kind of the quintessential uh, Jewish dietary chain right there. So you really can exist a somewhat comfortable life here, especially if you're a Jew who's adhering just to the like KD, like if you're not going full... Uh... Right. It's one thing my children always love upon takeoff or landing, landing more than takeoff is to spot the building from the airplane. And it's really, I mean, it's small, of course, when you look from the airplane, but they're able with different uh, landmarks, they're able to spot it quite quickly. So my uh, first face-to-face meeting with the uh, king, his majesty the king, was 
at an event taking place in CM Rip. Do you feel like you have some sort of uh, personal relationship with him in any context, or is it? I believe he meets many, many people, but uh, I'm sure if you ask him today if there's a Jewish center in town, he'll say, yes, I met the rabbi. That's amazing. This is the, you see, from here, you can see the building right there. Yeah, there you go. He has grown too far to be. But a Jew would catch that, you know? You think you're the only rabbi in the world that knows how to speak Mer? The only rabbi? Probably. But I think a greater point is my youngest child at a time, my chef, who only spoke two languages, Yiddish and Khmer. I don't think there's any other creature on earth that's <laughs> That is a very unique mix right there. Does Cambodia feel like home? Of course. Definitely. Yeah? Most definitely. That's my house. That's where I am. That's that's one and only place on earth that I have my own place, my own space. We came on a one-way ticket. I took an apartment here. It's a five-star furnished apartment. Who already knows that we're here? <laughs> I go down there to the reception and, and I find out that the owner of the hotel is actually a big fan of Jews. Yeah, this is where we do our events. All right, I'm leaving the Chabad house here right now. The rabbi was super amazing. I uh, I wish I could have ended the video with the rabbi, but <laughs> he kind of went into the synagogue and he was like, all right, I'm going home. Didn't even get a chance to really end the video. Yeah, it's funny, doing these videos, you know, you, you meet some really interesting characters. This rabbi is one of the most interesting characters I've met in a long time. But I really feel like we got a good gauge of some of the history and the ideas of the Jewish community here in Cambodia. Again, the building. Pretty amazing. What's up guys? Apologize for no outro in this video. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed watching the Jews of Cambodia unfold for you. I hope you guys have also been enjoying this series of exploring Jewish life across Asia. We've got some more exciting episodes coming up soon. Please make sure you become a member on the channel. We'll see you in the next one. I love you a long time. Goodbye, lads.